Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, Episode 2, Two Steps Back. The History of Byzantium is a podcast designed to continue the story of the Roman Empire from where the History of Rome podcast left off. However, the last few episodes of the History of Rome had an understandable bias toward the Western Empire. It was the western half that fell, and so key details about the east were not relevant to that story, and so were left out. We now need some of those details. So before we can pick up the story in 476, we're going to journey back a little to the accession of the Emperor Leo in 457. We're not going to cover Leo's reign in full, but I think we'd all benefit from a reminder of what was going on in the east so we can orient ourselves to this new Constantinopolitan-centric worldview, which will of course be the focus of this podcast. Part of this story was mentioned in the history of Rome, but for the benefit of new listeners and a coherent narrative, I hope you will forgive a little repetition. Leo was born in either Dacia or Thrace, in 401. He made his career in the army and was chosen by Aspar to be emperor in 457. As you may remember, Aspar was an Alan general who had taken on a similar role to that occupied by Aetius and Stilicho in the west. Aspar was head of the military establishment in the east and wielded great power in the capital. His influence was so great that when the emperor Marcion died, the Senate seemed willing to consider offering him the title. However, Aspar knew that this would be problematic. As both a barbarian and an Arian Christian, he knew that he would not be a popular choice with the people. So he turned to the 56-year-old Leo, an Orthodox Christian, and one of his staff officers. It seems apparent that Aspar saw Leo as a stepping stone to get his own son Ardabor crowned Caesar somewhere down the line. By this time, newly chosen emperors were brought into the Hippodrome and acclaimed by the Senate, army and people. In the case of Leo, though, a new ceremony was added which actually makes his reign an ideal place for our story to begin. Apparently at the insistence of the Patriarch Anatolius, Leo was crowned by the Patriarch in a Christian ceremony. This new Christian ritual is a nice roadmark of the change from when a princeps might be raised on the shields of his soldiers and made emperor to the world of Byzantium, where the emperor was seen as God's agent on earth and protector of all Christians. The practical decision to have Leo crowned may have been an attempt to add legitimacy to his position. Marcion had been the last of the Theodosian line, and so there was little beyond Aspar's recommendation to suggest why Leo should have gotten the job. Aspar had misjudged Leo, though, and far from a willing puppet, he had created a dangerous rival for power. The two disagreed over state policy immediately, and Leo began to make plans to weaken Aspar's position. The military establishment in Constantinople was dominated by men of Germanic descent, just as it was in the West. Aspar had strong links to the Ostrogoths settled in Thrace, and many of them served in the armies which were stationed around the capital. Leo decided to dilute this influence by bringing in a group of barbarians of his own, the Isaurians. Isauria was a region in south-central Anatolia, centred on the Taurus Mountains and running down to the Mediterranean coast. This unique geography made the area difficult to control, and the Isaurians were a constant source of trouble for the Romans, dating back to their collusions with Cilician pirates. In fact, the empire actually stationed frontier troops in Isauria as a sort of police force. Considering that Isauria is about a thousand miles from the border with the Persians, that should tell you how difficult the area was to govern. The Isaurian people had a reputation for being hardy and tough, and although they had long been Roman citizens, 
many in Constantinople still considered them to be barbarians. In this case, the term barbarian means unhellenized, or people who didn't understand the way civilized men ought to look and behave. The emperor Theodosius II had actually begun the policy of recruiting Isaurians, but now Leo took it a step further. He began to promote a group of soldiers under a chieftain called Tarasicodissa Rusum Bladiotis. Hmm. Thankfully, Tarasis decided to change his name to the more Greek-friendly Zeno, and Leo gradually promoted him to be master of the soldiers in Thrace, and then married him to his daughter Ariadne in 466. Aspar was still a powerful influence at court, though, and made common cause with Leo's brother-in-law, Basiliscus. Basiliscus, of course, was the man who botched the invasion of Africa and returned to Constantinople in disgrace when all those ships were left to burn down the coast from Carthage. The feud between Aspar and Zeno simmered throughout the late 460s. It appears that Aspar may have been responsible for a mutiny amongst the army in Thrace, which led to Zeno abandoning his post and fleeing in order to save his life. It was an experience that may have taught Zeno a valuable lesson. In 470, a plot was uncovered linking Aspar's son Ardabor to a scheme to undermine the emperor and turn the Isaurians to Aspar's cause. This was the last straw for Leo, who had Aspar and his son executed. This act set off a revolt in Thrace by Aspar's Ostrogothic allies, who elected a man called Theodoric as their leader. History remembers this man as Theodoric Strabo, or the Squinter, to distinguish him from the more famous Theodoric, who we will get to in a bit. Strabo demanded land for his people, and Aspar's old title and position. Leo refused, and the Goths ravaged Thrace and captured the city of Arcadiopolis. At the same time, some of the Goths who had been settled in Pannonia by the Emperor Marcion invaded Macedonia. Leo had to make a costly peace with both sets of Goths and agree to settle them in the Balkans. However, he had succeeded in breaking German control of the military in Constantinople. During the 5th century, two of the Eastern Empire's field armies were stationed in or around the capital, and although Strabo was given the title of Master of Soldiers in the Emperor's presence, he was not actually allowed into Constantinople. Zeno was appointed as the other Master of Soldiers, and the largely Isaurian force now came to dominate the city. Leo was now free to make Zeno's son, his grandson, his successor. In late 473, he named Leo II his heir, before dying, possibly of dysentery, in January 474. He was 73 years old and had ruled the East for 16 years. As I've only scratched the surface of Leo's reign... I won't pretend to be able to sum up the significance of it in my second podcast. However, it's interesting to think about the comparisons between East and West. In the West, the Empire ceased to exist when a German military commander dispensed with the imperial system. It is possible that something similar might have happened in the East if Germanic military influence hadn't been checked. But it was. And Leo's careful handling of Aspar was largely responsible for it. His successor, Leo II, was only seven at the time and was crowned emperor a few weeks later. Under instruction from his family, he appointed his father Zeno as co-emperor, which was both wise and fortunate, because Leo II died nine months later, leaving Zeno as sole ruler. Naturally, there are some suggestions that young Leo may have been killed but we have nothing reliable to base that suspicion on. Zeno's position was far from secure. Most historians think he was not a particularly commanding figure, and he was certainly viewed as an outsider. He relied for his position on his fellow Isaurians, who were also not popular with the residents of the capital. Their noisy, sometimes violent behavior did nothing for their reputation as barbarians. 
Zeno began his reign sensibly enough by negotiating with the Vandals to get Roman captives returned. However, it didn't take long for a conspiracy to form against the new emperor. One of the chief movers in this cabal was our old friend Basiliscus. Joining him were his sister Verena, Zeno's mother-in-law, and Theodoric Strabo. They managed to secure the support of Ilus, another Isaurian general, and in November 475, they made their move. It was hardly a daring plan. Zeno was presiding over games in the Hippodrome when Verena sent him a message. It warned him that the army, senate, and people were against him, and suggested that he run. Zeno must already have felt this to be a distinct possibility, because without questioning the message, he grabbed his family, left the city, and fled for his Isaurian homeland. Amazingly enough, then, Basiliscus, the man who had ruined the attempted restoration of the West, became emperor. As historian John Julius Norwich puts it, remarkable testimony to the power of human ambition. He did not last long, though. Finding the treasury empty, he sent out his tax gatherers and began selling offices. He also allowed a slaughter of the remaining Isaurians in the capital. This naturally didn't sit well with his Isaurian general, Ilus, who had been sent out to track down Zeno. Ilus switched sides again, and he and Zeno began to make plans to overthrow the new emperor. It's worth mentioning here a curious fact reported in some of the sources, which we will have to deal with in the next episode. It's reported that Ilus had captured Zeno's brother Longinus and was holding him prisoner in an Isaurian fortress. The suggestion is that Ilus used this leverage to help control Zeno and prevent the emperor from taking revenge on him for his part in the conspiracy. Back in Constantinople, Basiliscus put his nephew Harmatius in charge of the armed forces he had left and sent him out to put down the Isaurians. Zeno and Ilus offered Harmatius the role of Praetorian prefect and his son the chance to become Caesar if he would also switch sides, which he promptly did. In July 477, the Senate threw open the gates for Zeno, who reclaimed his throne only 20 months after vacating it. Basiliscus took refuge in the church of St. Sophia and was then sent into exile in Cappadocia, where he was apparently starved to death. Zeno's promise to Harmatius was not kept, and Basiliscus' nephew was soon executed. His son was spared, though, and forced into the service of the church. This finally brings us back to the end of the history of Rome. With Zeno back at his desk, one of the first letters he received was from Julius Nepos down in Dalmatia, asking for help to restore his position in Italy. A short while later, Odoacer's ambassadors arrived with their master's message that Zeno should consider himself the sole ruler of the Roman Empire, and that Odoacer was content with the title of patrician. Zeno's response was to write to Nepos, assuring him that he recognized him as the rightful Western emperor, but that, ah, uh, my support is only of the moral variety. He then sent a letter to Odoasa saying that he really ought to let Nepos back into Ravenna. Go on, be a good sport. However, the letter to Odoasa already addressed him as patrician a title which Zeno neatly claimed he wasn't conferring, but one that he considered already his. There's not a lot more Zeno could have done. After the massively expensive failure to take back Africa, it wasn't practical or possible to mount another expedition to restore the West. Zeno's own position was barely secure, and his western field armies were dominated by the unreliable Goths. So when the diadem and imperial cloak arrived at Constantinople, Zeno was forced to shrug and accept that he was the only emperor of the Romans now. Before we move forward with our story, there is a rather large issue I think we need to address. Basiliscus had managed to anger the people of Constantinople in another way that I haven't mentioned. 
he promoted a particular Christian theological position that went against the orthodox practice of the majority of his subjects. He was a Monophysite. Although Christianity played an important role in the history of Rome, it's going to play an absolutely massive one in the history of Byzantium. Part of the change from classical to medieval worlds is the part Christianity came to play in the lives of the citizens of the East. It's important in particular to understand a little more about Monophysitism, as it will continue to play a role in our story for some time to come. You'll recall that way back in 325, Constantine the Great had brought together as many bishops as he could for an ecumenical council in Nicaea. The conclusion of that council was that God and Jesus were of one substance, or in other words, the council believed that Christ had been part man and part divine. The need for this declaration had been to counter the Arian view that Jesus was created by God, and therefore was subordinate to God. If you are wondering why this distinction was important, then you need to think about the Christian belief that Jesus died on the cross to wash away our sins. If Jesus was subordinate to God, then it might seem to some that God hadn't personally redeemed us, only his subordinate had. This Arian view was largely stamped out within the empire, but survived amongst the Germanic peoples that invaded in the 5th century. They had been converted by Roman missionaries at a time when Arius' views were gaining popularity. The exact nature of Christ continued to be a hot-button issue, and in 448 an archimandrite, or abbot, named Eutyches, was accused of heresy. His doctrine suggested that Christ had one single nature, and that it was divine. Again, if you have trouble imagining why this caused such controversy, then consider what it suggests about Jesus' death on the cross. If he was entirely divine, then what are we to make of his apparently very human suffering? Eutyches appealed to the Pope and the Emperor, and for the next three years the Church was inflamed in debate, which at times turned violent. The newly minted Emperor Marcion summoned another ecumenical council in 451, which met at Chalcedon, just across the waters from Constantinople. The council condemned the monophysite position, mono being the Greek word for one, and physis being the word for nature. The council reiterated that Jesus was one person with two natures, one human and one divine. The council may have been a success locally, but in the East, the Monophysite position was not swept away. In fact, it found strong support in Egypt, Armenia, and Syria, which sowed the seeds of future discord. During the classical period of the empire, an Egyptian and a Roman could believe very different things about God, and it hardly mattered. Now, however, with only one God in town, there could only be one truth— and so passionate feelings were being aroused each decade over a new, seemingly hair-splitting point of theology. The Monophysite popularity in the East had another interesting side effect. While those in imperial service might have been expected to speak Latin, and Greek had long been the common tongue in the East, they were not the only languages being used. Syriac in Syria and Coptic in Egypt were spoken by many, and by this stage both had their own translations of scripture and their own liturgies. The fact that Monophysitism had support in particular geographic areas of the empire was not a good sign for the unity of the provinces. It's also worth remembering that none of these positions were as fixed or as easy to summarize as historians can make them sound. Many in the East favoured some kind of middle position and probably wouldn't have seen any glaring contradiction in their belief in the divinity of Christ with that of orthodoxy. For now, though, we return to 477 and the Emperor Zeno. Having locked the Western diadem away for safekeeping, he turned his attention to the governance of his empire. 
In two weeks' time, we will pick up the story, with Zeno trying to decide what to do about all those Goths stationed in the Balkans. Theodoric Strabo had not come to the defence of Basiliscus, who had shockingly blundered and offended his senior general. But now Zeno was back, and he was hardly likely to forget that Strabo had been part of the coalition which had ousted him from power. Before I go, I should tell you that the music on this podcast comes with kind permission from musicalley.com. Please let me know what you think of the podcast on iTunes, Facebook, or at thehistoryofbyzantium.wordpress.com. If you know anyone else who enjoyed the history of Rome, please tell them about the history of Byzantium. <laughs>